Please listen carefully. Welcome to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast from CityWorks Expo. Today we have Dr. Mindy Thompson Fully Love, who uh, has recently joined the new school after many years at Columbia University in their psychiatry department, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Um, and you're perhaps most famous for her research and book on urban renewal root shock and, and the follow-up ergon alchemy, uh, but she's been doing incredible work revolving around the health ramifications of some of the predominant trends in, in urban development and is just one of my heroes in this work, and it is just an absolute pleasure to have you here this morning, Dr. Foley Love. Um, thank you. Very kind of you to say. <laughs> Well, I know that you've impacted a, a, a great many people, and you've changed kind of some of the conversations about how we uh, how we get into this. But you know, your work is uh, you're kind of, I guess, most known for your conversations about urban renewal and and the, the kind of the repercussions of that. Uh, what can you give us a little bit of background on how your kind of work in all this started? I was studying the AIDS epidemic, and I was trying to understand why blacks and Hispanics in the United States had rates of, of HIV infection that were higher than the rates in white people. And um, there was a very important paper written by Roger Wallace, a human ecologist at, at New York State Psychiatric Institute, which talked about the urban policy of planned shrinkage and how that had affected the spread of AIDS in the Bronx. So I started looking at other urban policies to try to understand from a perspective, my perspective as a psychiatrist, how urban policies, you know, really got down to the level of uh, risk behaviors. So how does an urban policy of any kind affect individual choices around sex or drugs? So that's how I got into it. And you've been doing this for, you know, 15, 20 years at this point. Is that right? Uh, 30. 30, you. Uh, 30, 31, actually. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a minute. <laughs> when it's, I think one of the things that stuck out to me from your work is that you've got this, this uh, you know, kind of past and this history in the public health kind of sector, um, but that that has really uh, led you down many holes. And, and I think one of the, the themes that I come away with from your work is just the interconnectivity of everything. Um, from policies all the way down the line. And uh, is that something that you kind of uh, have noticed along the way as well? Yeah, I think that's very well put. Um, you can't uh, disconnect one thing from another. The, the colleges who try to teach us that it's all one ecosystem and everything is interdependent, actually I've, I've seen that in my work, and it's quite amazing. So the idea that, for example, in a city that you could neglect a neighborhood and it wouldn't have an impact on the whole city is just... Um, that's a false notion. When you look closely, every, the poor neighborhood that's being neglected is having a huge effect on the whole city. Hmm. And so, and I guess you know, I don't know how familiar you are with James Lovelock's guy. I work with this idea that things, these these natural things, but also these human built things, kind of operate as organisms. I think is kind of what I'm hearing there. That you that even though cities have these disparate parts, that they all work together to create a, a single whole. Yeah, and also I, I've become convinced that it's not terribly useful to separate what we call the natural environment and the built environment because people are animals like bees and cities are what we create. And, um, you know, if you go around the world, the cities are remarkably the same. Um, so cities are something, you know, it's in our collective both culture and genetic heritage, our, our dual heritage. So it's it's all one environment, and we're a part of it. So so how to see all that complexity? I think that's really the challenge, because we, we, we like to simplify, but the world around us is actually uh, pretty complicated. <laughs> I think that one of my favorite quotes of all time was an author that said that it's a moral imperative for us not to oversimplify the complexities that dictate our lives. Um, but That's it, a great quote. <laughs> I, it was in a very <laughs> weird place, too, but it's always stuck with me. Um, but, and it's, uh, it, I think that's really interesting. And it's, there's some interesting things as well, I think, in terms of 
we how we are dictates how we build these the built environment how we interact with everything around us but that also dictates significant outcomes does it not um yeah yeah you know the i'm sure the famous quote from sir winston churchill we shape our buildings and then our buildings shape us so it's a, it's very interactive the kinds of buildings the kinds of spaces we create create the kinds of ways we can assemble and relax and have festivals and work so it's very important to think about this um exchange that we have with the world around us now when you when you were doing this work and you realized that you had to get into policy stuff was, was that a moment of dread on your behalf um well i don't actually see myself as a person so much who gets into policy <laughs> stuff what uh, has happened for me is that i've I uh, tried to share my research with the community organizers who do the policy stuff. And community organizers are usually great people. So it's been huge fun to meet them and get to know them. And, um, and you know, they're really working hard to try to understand what's going on so that they can, you know, create social justice. So it's always a pleasure to work with such people. And so you're really right in that intersection of where the academy meets the the broader world, I suppose. Um, well, I'm really in the academy, um, but you know we're supposed to go out and tell people what we find. <laughs> so, um, and you know, I was lucky. I I worked for 26 years at New York State Psychiatric Institute as a research psychiatrist, but part of my job description was to disseminate my findings. So I, I really like that part of my job description, not just to find it, but to disseminate it, so to go out and tell people. So I, I think that's part of the academy, a part of our job. Well, at least it was part of my job. <laughs> uh, you know, I know that in my graduate school, there was often a discussion in, in the science world as to how how often to get involved. I think the medical world is a little bit better with that, but that in the in the pure science, there's often a lot of people that resist taking a stand, and it's it's... It can be a very contentious place at times if you refuse to take a stand, I suppose. Well, but the, the scientists who, I mean, it depends on your discipline and what you're finding. Uh, there's a lot of times when you should refuse to take a stand because it takes a long time to get the science to a point where you actually really know what's going on. It's a lot of evolution. Think about, is coffee good for your health or bad for your health? You know, we get new studies every couple of years, and it's like, coffee's good, coffee's bad, coffee's good, coffee's bad. So um, it takes a while for, you, you need, it's not just one study, it's a series of studies, and then it's analyzing how they fit together. So science is right to say you need some time, but when you have a clear finding, then the obligation is to go out and say it. Well, I, I think one of the things that intrigues me the most about this, this conversation and where a lot of the people that I met in my studies that were uncomfortable where it comes in is that there's a there's kind of a discomfort in moving from thinking about the problem to thinking about the solution. Is uh, How have you found kind of that, that transition in your own work? Well, uh, as you pointed out, I wrote Root Shock, which came out in 2004, but while I was writing Ruchak, I was, I was, you know, traveling around and visiting with uh, urbanists in France and the United States. And so I had seen a lot over the years of, of what they were doing. So it, it seemed to me that I could take all of those observations, which were, um, and, you know, there were just a lot of them. And try to figure out what it was that people that I thought were really trying to solve the problems I had observed, what they were doing. So that's how I came to write Urban Alchemy. So it was a, uh, and that was it was a really great experience to go back to people that I for whom I had great admiration, and say, yeah, can you tell me the story of your work, and can you help me write uh, a book describing what I call the elements of urban restoration. So the the key ideas that seem to run a that seemed to span the 10 urbanists that I was writing about. Were there any of those uh, lessons that came out of that uh, in Urban Alchemy that really surprised you or, or that you weren't expecting to be there? Um, well, the, the first element of urban restoration, because there, there are nine that I identify in the book, is uh, keep the city in mind. 
And when I first learned that, uh, that was really quite a surprise because I was very focused on studies in neighborhoods because um, public health is often working in uh, what we would call marginalized and vulnerable neighborhoods. And so Michelle cantal Dupar, a French urbanist I've studied with for a long time, said it, it's true that the problems are there, but it really is a symptom of a problem in the larger city. And you have to fix the problem at the level of the city. So you have to always keep the city in mind. That was quite a surprise. Um, and probably the biggest surprise of all. Hmm. Well, I guess in some ways that uh, that comes down to kind of these big institutions that are driving a lot of these things. And, you know, I think some of the uh, stuff that comes away from your work is that these big institutions can cause big harm over the years and have uh, consistently caused big harm, but that they also are necessary to be part of the solution, right? That's the struggle. That's the struggle. How do you get the government to um, not be an institution of harm? It's it's the humanity of governance. I think is one of the big issues that we have yet to to uncover and answer to. I suppose as we move forward here. Absolutely, absolutely, and and it's partly because the you know the the state is in some ways a, a tool of a tool of the system as opposed to representing all the people. It represents the most. It really works on behalf of the most powerful. So this gets to be a problem for the rest of us who don't have a lot of power. So get, getting that balanced out is, is our, you know, that's the eternal struggle. Well, it's it's one that we're still absolutely trying to figure out. It's uh, one of my big beliefs is that we don't yet know the answers, and it's it's always fascinating to see how different people approach these questions. And it's uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Choice Neighborhood Grants, and we here in Roanoke are going through uh, application process for that again and it's it's just it's fascinating to see from the perspective of institutions that really want to do well uh and yet we're not sure really how to proceed on that front yeah yeah absolutely makes perfect sense but of course the interconnectedness that we mentioned earlier is is part of what makes this so difficult and that we uh, our institutions are so divided in some ways that we don't have an entity that really embraces the interconnectivity in some ways. Would you would you agree with that kind of sentiment? I would. I would. I I think we um, as psychiatrists, I think that we uh, exist in a consciousness basically of individualism, and that the crisis of our era is really a transformation of of consciousness from individualism to interdependence. And um, that we, everybody at every level, every position has to understand the interdependence and be looking for it. You know that exercise that the Iroquois do of thinking about the, the ramifications for the seventh generation? We were doing that exercise at a conference I'd organized two weeks ago. And it's quite a remarkable exercise. It really makes you think differently. So I, I think that is like a really good example of what, where we have to go. But I, it's so difficult. I mean, when you this this question of individual versus collective is one that I I struggle with all the time, and it's one that interests me perhaps more than any other. And it's it seems like we keep leaning more individualistic, and it's uh, that question of how to uh, create shared value in this world is such a difficult question. It seems it is. It's a very difficult question. But it's uh, I, I'm intrigued to to move a little bit. To, you know, we're kind of in in the world of urban development or whatever. We're kind of uh, getting to a place where we're understanding the importance of place attachment. That's kind of a phrase that's entering the zeitgeist. But it's in some ways that seems to go back to your work in many ways. And I just wondered if you could you could speak briefly on what uh, why it is that being forced to move for one reason or another is such a, a big deal for many of these communities. So the um, tradition of, of attachment, one of the great writers on the subject was John Bowlby, who did the really profound work on attachment in children and describing it as this fundamental human connection, but basically looking at babies and their mothers. But he also said that, that we have a secondary system of homeostasis, which is the world around us. 
in, so he didn't call that place attachment, but he certainly set it up in, in his writings. And that has been developed by many authors. And it's, it's quite fundamental. It, not only do we depend on, on the people close to us, but we depend on the place where we live because we have to find food and water and shelter where we live, where we are. And, and so that that's becomes a relationship of dependence. We can't supply ourselves with everything we need. The place has to supply us. So fertile soil so that we could grow crops, for example, is place taking care of us. And, you know, a farmer who has a really fertile field loves it very much. I was talking to a farmer um, in Philadelphia who has a plot in a community garden, and he's had that plot for 45 years, and has built up the soil and loves it. And, but the community garden is on a year-by-year lease from the airport, which could swipe the land at any time, not caring about it. And so this elderly gentleman, you could see in his face the attachment he had to this land that he'd nurtured and that nurtured him by providing him with crops and uh, that his love was so profound. It was one of those like really deep moments for me as a psychiatrist to understand this reciprocity that's the heart of place attachment. It's, it, it really keeps us alive. If that gentleman were to lose his land, it would be hard for him to keep going, mm. I believe. That's it's so fascinating, and it's it's heartbreaking at the same time. I, I, it's such a an interesting connection there between our land and and who we are as people in some ways that uh, it's it's deep seated in who we are in some ways. Yeah, it's not separate wherever you live, and it doesn't require that the place be great. So people who live in a you know really run down old shack, you know, man's home is his castle. So that's where they live. So that whatever they find in that place, that's what they have. So we have to have a great respect for something that m- might look like not much, as we do for something that obviously is fabulous. Hmm. In fact, somebody who has seven homes probably has less attachment to each of those fabulous homes as somebody who has one, you know, cardboard shack. Hmm. Well, and, uh, you know, one of the other common refrains that we would obviously be remiss to not talk about here is that race obviously plays it or has played a huge role in this discussion in the past and continues to. Um, can, can you speak a little bit about that as well? Yeah, we're doing a project um, with my colleagues at, at the New School and at, at the University of Orange on uh, the anniversary of Jamestown, which is coming up. So first slaves arrived in Jamestown in uh, 1619. Um, so the, in 2019, it'll be the 400th anniversary of that event. So we've been looking at this 400 years of inequality and what that's, what that's like. So, you know, race becomes a fundamental tool of establishing division in early on in Virginia. Um, and so historians point to Bacon's Rebellion as a point when white indentured servants and white small landowners and black slaves got together. And then the ruling class in Virginia was very frightened by that. So they did all kinds of things to convince the poor whites that they were better than the, than the black slaves and to create that division and undermine that real force for, for change, powerful force for change. And so we've been living with that ever since. And, and the inequality is easily... Once you have the concept of inequality, that there's some fundamental differences among people, then you can just slot anybody into the who's better and who's worse as soon as you have the concept. So we've really suffered from this concept of inequality for a long time. But, you know, and it's just one of those, it's false. People are, men aren't better than women and whites aren't better than blacks and on and on and on. Well, it's had serious ramifications in everything we've done as a people in, in this country in the past 200 years. And, you know, as we try and come to grips with that now and move forward, I wonder, you know, if you could speak a little bit about, even though, you know, we may say that segregation uh, as codified in the in the mid-century is over, but the after effects of that are still definitely living on. And I wonder if you could you could speak a little bit about that as well. I think it's hard to argue that we've overcome segregation (laughs) when all of our major cities are terribly segregated. Um, And our schools, people say, are more segregated than they were before 
Brown versus Board of Education was decided by the Supreme Court in 1954. And when, you know, so many things, risk for so many things is decided by a race and opportunity. So we're still highly segregated. Never, we never finished that struggle. Um, but I think that what happens is that it's dynamic because people push back against these oppressive things and then uh, they, they change, but they don't seem to go away. They, but so they keep mutating. Um, and so it's, it's figuring out, okay, well, how do we struggle against how it looks now? It looks terrible, but how do we see it? How do we name it? How do we struggle against it? Um, you know, people talk about mass incarceration as the new slavery I don't think it's a terribly good analogy, but what they're trying to do is name the ways in which these these issues have become manifest in our time. Same issue. So they call it the new, the new Jim Crow or the new slavery or the new something. Um, so it's definitely new. Hmm. And that, that makes it harder. We have to invent new ways to struggle. Well, and it's, uh, I was having a conversation with someone recently about the difficulties of public engagement in communities that have been uh, subjugated so often in the past, and it's it just becomes so hard to rebuild that trust. I remember, I'll never forget a conversation I had where some, I asked someone, like, what uh, do you think that these wounds that were propagated by urban renewal and other forces, will they ever heal in our lifetime? And she her face visibly fell, and it, uh, she said, no, it'll it'll never happen in our lifetime. And that was an incredibly powerful moment and it's uh, i think that your work is is uniquely positioned to tell us something about the the health ramifications and partic- particularly the mental health ramifications of all of this stuff that has happened in the past well we don't know what could happen in our lifetime because surprising things happen um, i never thought we could communicate instantly across the whole globe <laughs> via the internet <laughs> Now we can, um, you know, somebody invented the telephones, you know, the people invent things. We could invent the antidote to racism. Somebody could do it or just be gone. So you never, you never want to say, you know what the future could hold, I believe. But when somebody says, no, it won't be fixed, I think what they're describing is, is their morale, you know, their, their confidence that people can work together and have solidarity. So solidarity is the eighth element of urban restoration that I found in the work of all the urbanists I, I studied. And so so this idea that um, we have to work together and, and we have to keep our spirits up. So the ninth element of urban restoration is celebration, that you have to restore people's spirits and give them, you have to, you have to get them in motion. This is, a, this is a long struggle and if it's never ending, if in fact we're not going to wipe racism out, we're only going to you know, suppress it, then we have to be eternally vigilant. Um, The human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, mutates very rapidly, a little bit like racism. And so you have to take some medicine constantly. You can't stop. And you have to say, you have to take medicine every day, every day, every day for your life. But if you do that, you can have a normal life. So how do you keep your spirits up that we have to be vigilant for a whole lifetime? So the, there you have it. But, so we have to keep our spirits up. And, and, and we, but we don't know. It could, all we know is today. We don't know tomorrow. Tomorrow could be amazing. Hmm. It's, uh, that question is uh, of how to maintain hope and celebration is such an important one. And I, uh, your your words are very reassuring to me, and I appreciate them very deeply. And this that sense of hope is, uh, and possibility is one that I think uh, can be hard to grasp after after someone has spent years in there. And I uh, I love to hear that. Uh, is there something that you've found that you think has been crucial to your ability and communities you've seen the ability to maintain that hope and and, and uh, sight of possibility? What I what I think is that um, the what maintains hope is being in motion. That you get depressed when you sit still and just see all the problems around you. 
it, it's a little bit like when you have a big party and there are a lot of dishes in the sink when you wake up in the morning. <laughs> and you could be in despair or, you know, the whole house could be a wreck if it was a really good party. Uh, but what you got to do is just start washing dishes and picking up the napkins and putting the glasses in the sink. And, and pretty soon your house looks great again. So life is like that. You know, we, we look around and we're like, oh, my God, there's so many problems, you know, and global warming and unemployment and four famines right now. You know, where do you start? Well, you just start with the first glass. So I, I think that's the key. you got to keep people in motion. What are we doing this week? Oh, we're having a potluck. Let's go. Has there been uh, a, a key to get that motion, to get past that initial inertia that you found to be the most successful? Yeah, you have to get people to a meeting. You have to get some people to a meeting. It doesn't matter how many. Um, we've been working with a project in Niagara Falls, and their organizing consultant had basically started with a seven-person resident engagement council, and then each of those seven people brought in people. And so from the seven people in June, they grew to a party of 144 people mm. in December. So you just need the seven people. The Magnificent Seven is all you need. <laughs> and if you've only got the Magnificent Three, that's fine. You know, you start with what you got. You just got to start. That's, uh, I love that. I love that in so many ways. And it's, uh, I, I completely agree as well. Well, I, I I do want to pivot a little bit here and just ask you kind of, you know, you've been to communities all over the world and, and looked at many things. And I, you've written books, obviously, about this. But I wonder uh, what when you see a place that you think is is working well or that is grappling with these issues in a way that's effective and, and innovative and impactful. Um, what what does that look like to you or what what are the components that you almost always see present in that place? Well, and you know, I um, places are nested within places are nested within places, right? And so the the issue of what it, what does it mean that a place is successful? The you know does that mean a neighborhood is successful or a block is successful, um, or a city is successful or a region is successful? Uh, and what does that mean if we have four famines in the world? So if one block is doing well, but there are four famines, you know, what does it mean? So if you take this psychological consciousness seriously, we're all doing badly. That's how I see it. I don't think that's a cause for despair, but I think we're all doing badly right now. I think the United States is hugely divided, worse than ever. And that's a very dangerous thing for a society to have such virulent division given prominent place in the politics of the nation. So, um, and the world is, you know, full of troubles. So, I, I just wouldn't say that I've seen a place, you know, I, what I, but what I look for is are people trying. And that's remarkable when you see it. I'm, I'm part of a project in a neighborhood called Eastwick. And I got to know this neighborhood through David Jenkins, a man I write about in, in Root Shock, because that was his neighborhood and he was displaced at age 11 by urban renewal. And so that neighborhood now is confronting a mountain of problems the neighborhood has a super fun site. It has subsidence, so some of the homes are cracking apart. It has flooding. It is, it is threatened by sea level rise. They drove highways and huge arterial roads through this quiet little neighborhood, and on and on. Oh, what a mountain of problems. On the other hand, in Eastwick, they get the highest percentage of, of people out to a meeting of any place I've ever been. Hmm. So they're they're trying in the face of of, uh, you know, just like, how, how do you keep going in the face of all this? But they do. They love their neighborhood and they're fighting for it. And I, and I think to add to that is that we, none of us can just fight for our neighborhood. We have to fight for the whole world. So, so that's what I look for if people are in motion. That, you know, that magnificent seven, are they out getting the rest of the 144 people? That's what will save us. Hmm. I love uh, that's so powerful, and it also speaks the the global vision is so powerful as well that this is uh, we are so much more than just our communities, and that but that the work that we do in our communities has I would I would guess you would agree global ramifications as well that the work that we're doing 
even in Roanoke or, or in Eastwick or wherever is that is not just work for that one community. That is work that is part and parcel of a, a bigger initiative to to impact uh, global change in some ways. I think so. I believe that. But, you know, like you said, you've been doing this work for, for many years, and I, I just wonder if we could perhaps finish off with one of your favorite stories of uh, something that you've seen that has uh, been meaningful and impactful for you as as you've done this work. Um, well, my hometown is Orange, New Jersey, and uh, I was one of those kids that, you know, left home swearing never to go back. And after I'd seen a lot of other cities, I came back to Orange and I realized that it was um, that everything you wanted to know about the American city you could learn in Orange, New Jersey, <laughs> which struck me as astounding. I, I didn't know my hometown was such a cool place. And so I've been hanging out here and a number of us founded this free people's university called the University of Orange. And one of our thoughts was that people really needed to understand um, the richness of Orange because it's majority minority city and you know it's just kind of poor so people are like oh there's nothing there but in fact it's an amazing place and we think of it as the most historic city in the united states so we've been creating this uh, website collecting stories and putting them on a website called hidden treasures of orange which we're launching um in april and it's been remarkable um, so one of my students came to visit and said, much as I enjoyed the visit to Orange, it was the recorded stories that really helped me understand the city, which is our goal, that we think that by people telling their stories that you get to understand the goal, the, the place. And this really started with a collection of stories that was made by some high school kids, and they defined what stories they wanted to tell. So it's like the middle school dance you know, winning a, winning a hat at the middle school dance and uh, as well as um, how Martin Luther King Jr. visited Orange the week before he died. So that's sort of really capturing the essence and the complexity of, of my hometown. And that's been a really wonderful experience for me. Hmm. Well, what a, what a powerful experience to end on. Uh, for those of you all listening, if you'd like to hear um, Dr. Foley Love's talk from CityWorks Expo a couple of years ago, you can check out our website, cityworksexpo.com. But uh, thank you so much for being with us today. It's been an absolute pleasure, Dr. Foley Love, and, and you're an inspiration for so many of us. Well, thank you so much for taking time to talk with me. Of course. And have a great CityWorks Expo. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the Big Ideas for Better Places podcast today. If you like what you hear, please subscribe and leave a rating. It really helps other people find out about our fascinating guests and find the information that we have to share. Lastly, please save the day for our upcoming event, October 5th through 7th in Roanoke, Virginia. And keep up to date by following us on Facebook and checking out our website, cityworksexpo.com. That's cityworksxpo.com. Thank you guys again and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you.